This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. At the height of the Cold War, with nuclear anxiety at a fever pitch, the United States launched their first spy satellites, the Corona, tasked with photographing deep inside the Soviet Union. US intelligence was focused on searching for signs of nuclear weapon development and testing, but found a lot more than they bargained for. These early satellites were launched with rolls of film with no way of transmitting the data contained within them to Earth through electronic means, and thus the film had to be recovered and developed here on Earth. Once the film was filled, the satellite would eject a re-entry vehicle containing the precious undeveloped photos back to Earth where they could be caught by a passing plane as they drifted down. On one such mission, a strange object began to emerge from the Caspian Sea as the film developed. A gigantic aircraft, nearly 100 meters long, with short stubby wings, much too short to fly like a conventional aircraft. US intelligence had never seen anything like it. As they received more pictures, it was clear the craft was moving at the same speed as a traditional aircraft, while outsizing even the largest of modern day American military planes like the Lockheed C-5M. It was even emblazoned with the flag of the Soviet Navy, not the Soviet Air Force. This discovery set alarm bells off within US intelligence. Had the Soviets developed a breakthrough in propulsion which could give them the upper hand in naval combat? Confused on what they were seeing, the US dubbed the machine the Caspian Sea Monster, but the Soviets weren't developing a gigantic hydrofoil or seaplane. This giant aircraft secretly being developed was actually in a cranoplan, a gigantic vessel capable of skimming across the ocean surface at high speeds. In 1962, the Central Hydrofoil Design Bureau assigned Chief Designer Rostislav Alexiev to begin working on a prototype plane. Alexiev had cut his teeth developing hydrofoil planes, like the Rocketta. These craft can easily be defined as a boat. They used a hydrofoil, essentially a wing designed to act in water, to lift the boat's hull out of the water as it gained speed, allowing it to reduce drag and increase top speeds. But the Soviets wanted to take this a step further. The Ekrano plan would make use of something called ground effect to fly at a very low altitude above the ocean's surface. Ground effect occurs when a fixed wing aircraft flies at an altitude less than the length of its wingspan. As large masses of air come into contact with the aircraft, the profile of the wing deflects the air downwards, compressing the air between the wing and the ground. This trapped air can cause an area of higher than normal pressure under the wing resulting in a boost to lift. This happens with all aircraft during takeoff and landing and is something all pilots have to learn to deal with. For example, some planes can get off the ground when overloaded, but won't be able to climb past the altitude where ground effect is in play. Ekrano plans are designed in such a way to maximize this effect and never leave the ground effect zone. Just as our plane can get off the ground when overloaded, the Ekrano plan can be heavier without the need for extra power. An aircraft with this ability could be a powerful tool in open sea combat. It would fly under enemy radar for much longer due to the radar shadow under the Earth's curvature. It would be capable of transporting tons of equipment and personnel quickly while avoiding enemy mines and torpedoes. Or it could be fitted with weapons of its own to quickly attack enemy ships before escaping. Imagine if a vehicle like this was available for the D-Day landings, the largest amphibious assault in history. The Allies would have been able to transport tons of equipment and troops across the channel in a 15 minute trip. The appeal of the technology was enormous and the first prototype named the KM was built and secretly transported to the Caspian Sea to begin testing. This enormous vehicle instantly became the largest aircraft ever built with a wingspan of 37.6 meters and a length of 92 meters. It weighed a massive 240 tons, but it could take off with almost double that. Powered by eight Dobrynin VD-7 turbojets mounted at the front and two on the tail, which provided a total of 1,275 kilonewtons of thrust, about 30% more than a Boeing 747. The first test flight of the KM took place on the 16th of October, 1966, with chief designer Alexiev on board. At the time, it was forbidden for Soviet aircraft designers to be on board test vehicles like this in case they were involved in an accident. But test pilot Vladimir Loganov lobbied for Alexiev to be on board to allow him to experience and refine his designs. 
The first tests were successful, showing the KM could fly with optimum fuel efficiency at 430 km per hour and with a maximum operational speed of 500 km per hour. During some high speed tests, it's claimed that it achieved a speed of 650 km per hour. The KM was a valuable proof of concept and laid the groundwork for all future Ekrano plants. Alexiev took the lessons learned and began to develop a new transport version designed specifically for the transport of military equipment and troops called the Orleonok. This was a much smaller variant, 58 meters long with a 31.5 meter wingspan and a maximum takeoff weight of 140 metric tons. Its engine layout was fascinating with a massive NK12 turboprop engine mounted on the tail as far away from the salt water as possible. These massive 6 meter diameter counter rotating turbo propellers developed 11,000 kilowatts of power, making it the most powerful turboprop engine to ever enter service. It also featured two nose mounted turbofan engines with air intakes on top of the nose to minimize water intake. The exhaust of these engines were pointed under the wings to enhance the ground effect phenomenon by bolstering the air cushion with the high pressure output of the jet engine. These engines were only needed on takeoff before the plane could gain the speed needed to develop enough lift through the wing and ground effect. Once this was achieved, they were shut down to decrease fuel consumption. The Orleanoch featured a nose mounted cargo door and wheels to allow the plane to drive onto land and unload. This was a fully functional Ekrano plan and actually entered and remained in service until 1993, although only four were ever built. Details from here vary and I found it difficult to find an authoritative source of information on what happened to Alexiev after the development of the Orleanoch was complete. Some say he crashed in the KM, others in the Orleanoch and others say he crashed in a Volga 2, a small passenger transport Ekranoplan. But they all seem to point towards Alexiev being fired as chief designer as a result and dying a short time later. Whether that was from injuries from the crash or natural causes, I have no idea. With Alexiev out of the picture and the Soviet Union on the brink of collapse, development of Akrano plans in the Soviet Union slowly began to fizzle out. They managed to develop a slightly smaller version of the KM designed to launch anti-ship missiles while out at sea. In 1987, the first version of this vehicle was built and named the Lun. This vehicle weighed 286 tons, had a length of 74 meters and a wingspan of 44 meters. The tail mounted engines were removed completely. It was instead powered by eight NK87 turbofans mounted on the front of the craft, each producing 127 kilonewtons of thrust. The Lun entered the Soviet Navy in 1987. However, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, only one model was ever completed and it remains in its dry dock on the shores of the Caspian Sea to this day. The idea of a wing in ground effect plane has its merits, but it has simply never found its niche in any military. The Germans made a smaller Akrana plan in the 70s called the X114, but it never made it into service. The Chinese also experimented with an Akrano plan called the XTW4, which was built in 1999 and went through multiple tests a year later. The vehicle was once spotted in a Chinese shipping port on Google Maps, but has since vanished. While in 2002, Boeing presented their plans to build the largest Akrano plan ever, dubbed the Pelican. They claimed the craft would be longer than a football field and capable of hauling 17 M1 Abram tanks across an ocean. But the US Congress rejected the plans in 2005, there just wasn't a need for such a plane. Wing in ground effect planes may yet find their niche, but for now safety and reliability concerns are its primary roadblock. Flying at such a low altitude provides very little time for corrective maneuvers and poor weather with high waves or wind prevents any Akrano plan from operating. Some have sought to develop smaller passenger versions like the A050, which the Russian Embassy of South Africa, your definitive Russian news source, claimed it would be ready for service in the next three years. Vehicles like this could find a valuable niche in archipelago regions like Southeast Asia, where increasing wealth and populations, combined with relatively short distances between islands, could provide a market for these temperamental craft. However, traditional planes will always remain a much more efficient and reliable form of transport over long distances, as flying in the lower density air of the upper atmosphere drastically decreases drag. So these passenger versions would have to operate extremely short haul distances where airliners waste time during climbing and ascent. 
This technology is perfectly viable for the right application, and we may yet see someone solve the problem and build a successful business from it. That could be you, but you will first have to learn how to solve problems. A good place to start is through Brilliant's daily challenges. Each day, Brilliant presents you with interesting scientific and mathematical problems to test your brain. Each daily challenge provides you with the context and framework that you need to tackle it, so that you can learn the concepts by applying them. If you like the problem and want to learn more, there's a course that explores the same concept in greater detail. If you are confused and need more guidance, there's a community of thousands of learners discussing the problems and writing solutions. Daily challenges are thought-provoking challenges that will lead you from curiosity to mastery, one day at a time. If I have inspired you and you want to educate yourself, then go to brilliant.org forward slash real engineering and sign up for free. And the first 500 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So you can get full access to all their courses as well as their entire daily challenges archive. As always, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, subreddit and Discord server are below.